I'm, I'm Victor. I come from the Association for Research and Analysis, uh, ZMAI, which is located in, in North Macedonia, in, in the capital of North Macedonia, Skopje. Um, as a team of experts, uh, especially experts in the area of public finance and fiscal policies, uh, our association has been working very closely with uh, ICLD on developing different tools that will help local governments um, increase their transparency, accountability um, levels, and of course, uh, give them additional support, uh, especially in uh, including and make uh, their processes more um, uh, uh, or engage citizens to be uh, to take part in all the budget, especially uh, process budget related processes. So I won't be talking more about uh, who we are and what we do. I would like to jump in um, at the very beginning uh, to the presentation that I have prepared and to talk especially about one very important um, part of the uh, budget process, which is called uh, the creation of uh, uh, and publishing of a citizen budget. Among other things uh, and among other experiences in my life, um, I had a chance to work at the Ministry of Finance of, um, of North Macedonia as an advisor to the minister uh, in the key areas that required uh, transparency, openness, uh, and of course, some other processes that especially focused on EU integration and international collaboration. Among other things, we realized that the budget process is very close to the public. And the public generally doesn't understand a lot about what budgets are and how they're made. Especially um, problematic was the perception of the citizens that the budgets that the governments create belong to the government and not to the citizen. And in order to narrow that gap and to bring more opportunities for citizens to get engaged and involved in the budget planning process, we were encouraged to open the, um, the public finances to the rest of the world. Um, I'll talk a lot about my experience with uh, creating and starting and publishing the first citizen budget uh, of North Macedonia, but before I start with the official presentation, uh, I would also like to share one of the um, uh, the deliverables that uh, we had while working with the ICLD on uh, the latest research we, we did. Um, now I would like to um, uh, show you a short video uh, that showcases uh, both the research we did and uh, how local governments can uh, involve citizens in the budget uh, process. So in the next two and a half minutes, enjoy the video. How is public money spent? There is something called the budget process, which plans how resources are distributed to meet citizens' needs, such as building schools, protecting the local environment to overcome impacts of climate change, and supporting marginalised groups. Did you know that both the citizens and local governments can benefit from this process? The people who know the needs of a community best are the citizens, and the people who represent these citizens are the politicians. Therefore, both should participate. However, this is not happening. According to a study improving local budget processes developed in North Macedonia, several explanations for this can be identified. For example, local governments publish budget documents on their websites, but very few people read them as they tend to be long and confusing. Consequently, almost no one knows that there are budgetary plans, nor do they know the result of the investments. Also, there are no spaces for the citizenry to be informed and evaluate the budget planning process. What's more, in the few available spaces, the local authorities include people who do not fully represent local needs, and even if the whole community participated, it is usually too late to propose significant changes to the budget. So, how can citizens be involved? According to the study, there are four possible mechanisms to achieve this. Firstly, 
governments should create communications and financial education campaigns so that everyone can know how public resources are distributed and what documents are used. Secondly, to guarantee transparency and clarity of information, citizens should have access to a simple and understandable web platform with explanations of the budget process. A well-informed community can offer substantial opinions. Therefore, the third point has to be about the direct participatory mechanisms where events are organised for citizens to vote and determine which projects they wish to see funded with the budget. Then, politicians can better understand the needs of marginalised groups. Finally, the creation of a quality and citizen participation indicator is proposed, which would measure transparency, accountability, inclusion and equity in the budget process to incentivize local governments to improve this process. To learn more about these mechanisms, visit the ICLD website and explore the Improving Local Budget Process paper. This is a tool to guarantee citizen participation. Okay, uh, this is a great video that, um, oops, uh, sorry. This is a great video to showcase uh, the, um, the big picture of um, the whole budget process. And um, it is not, um, it is worth mentioning that uh, the citizen budget on its own, it's not a separate process. It is definitely part of the overall budget process and the overall transparency mechanisms that one municipality or a central government can have in order to bring the public finances closer to the people. So uh, before we specifically talk about the citizen budget and how we should make it, I would like to give a, a short overview and in, introduction to the principles on, of transparency and how the citizen budget uh, gets into that picture or uh, is considered as one of the key stepping stones um, of the achievement of uh, greater uh, transparency, accountability, and equitable um, uh, budget process. So as you can see, there are points that we are going to go through today's uh, presentation workshop, uh, call it as you as you wish. Uh, we will not be strict to, to, to the order, but uh, feel free to jump in uh, whenever you have a comment or you want to uh, share your personal experience regarding any of the topics. So the first question that uh, we need to ask ourselves is, well, what is the core meaning of the word uh, um, uh, fiscal transparency? And why do we even mention this, uh, this word fiscal transparency? Fiscal transparency is um, uh, simply, it is uh, a term that should explain the fact that the data that local and central governments share uh, should be very clear, should be accessible, should be reliable, and comprehensive to the information regarding the financial states and financial activities of one um, municipality or central government. W but why do we need this? Citizens need to know about fiscal, trans uh, fiscal uh, and financial activities and information, especially knowing that the municipalities and the central governments depend on the citizens' contribution to make the budget. So if we want to have a fair process of this distribution of public funds, we need to have the citizens engaged and informed. But in order for the citizens to be engaged and informed, they have to have uh, this type of uh, information, information that will be clear, which means that it is not, it, it, it cannot be interpreted any other way, but the way they are supposed to be in given. They are accessible, the data is accessible, which means that it can be easily uh, downloaded, taken, or copied by citizens so that they can uh, work with it, analyze it, and then report on it based on uh, the use they, they had. Reliable, which means that 
the local governments and the central governments provide a source of information that is validated and can be reliable source of information and knowledge that can then be shared with the larger audiences. Of course, comprehensiveness is one of the key uh, elements that, or factors that uh, financial data and financial fiscal transparency should uh, have and consider, especially knowing that it is a horizontal issue and it doesn't only affect uh, fiscal and financial information. I can hear some noise in the background. If somebody has the microphone on, uh, please turn it off. Or if you want to jump in and, and, and comment on something, uh, please interrupt me at, at any time. But uh, transparency in general uh, doesn't only rely on, uh, on fiscal uh, data and fiscal information. However, the principles of transparency apply, the general principles of, uh, of transparency apply to the fiscal uh, data as well. As I've already mentioned, some of those, um, those key or uh, key principles, um, there are several that need to be pointed out as well. Besides the reliability, completeness, clarity, and openness of, of, the, of the data that is shared, the data should be timely. The data should be shared at the moment when it's most relevant to the public. Very often when we talk about transparency, there are public institutions that would claim that they have shared the data with the citizens through different uh, ways and channels and sources. But when you see the date when it was published, you see that it's way beyond any deadlines or any logical time frame that a data set should be or in data information should be published. Therefore, especially when we talk about fiscal transparency and financial data, time is a very valuable principle to take into consideration. Of course, if you want to make um, a serious analysis of the trends of the fiscal um, fiscal data, and especially data related to the budget um, expenditures, there has to be consistency in the data that is shared. The consistency secures that the analysis, the research that is done later on can be compared throughout the time, uh, a certain time period. Uh, this is very important, especially when you want to create uh, and engage citizens in creating um, policies that are relevant for everyone, and especially policies that have a time spent that is uh, over the fiscal year, which means that they're on a middle or, or a long term, or, that have a middle or, or long term uh, perspective. Of course, even though it is, uh, we can claim that it is um, a separate process, uh, participation, it is a key also a key principle of the overall uh, transparency. Why? Because the opportunity for citizens uh, to participate in the budget making process allows the citizens to be engaged since the very beginning and not to be informed late. As we saw in the video, the research shows that very often, especially when we talk about local um, local governments and local fiscal transparency, we face with the fact that even when there is public consultations and public participation in the process, it's either too late or it's only a formal process of uh, engaging with the citizens just for the fact of showing that a certain uh, institution, municipality uh, is open to the citizens. Therefore, if we have all these principles in mind, we have to make sure that we create tools that will be um, that will uh, have all these principles taken into account and be available uh, and open to everyone that is interested in participating in this uh, in this process. But is fiscal transparency the only remedy for good fiscal governance? No. It is only one of the steps 
that each government, each institution that is involved in the budget making process um, that should be considered by an institution that is involved in the budget making process. Being transparent doesn't mean that you integrally uh, do good job with your fiscal openness or uh, to simplify this um, without um, or to explain it further uh, without a strong um, fiscal institution or institutions, which means without strong public administration that will be able to actually implement these processes throughout the years without depending on political will, having uh, policies that are based on uh, the research, the participation of the citizens, have sound fiscal management practices that are introduced within the, uh, the, the institutions on a central and, and, and local level. And of course, having accountability mechanisms, the transparency will only be um, left alone and won't serve the purpose, uh, the, its own uh, and original uh, purpose of actually opening up the public finances, especially to the citizens. Therefore, leaving transparency without it being followed by participation, accountability, and creating sustainable and equitable um, policies, we cannot talk about an open system, a system that wants to uh, share and contribute uh, information to the, the overall uh, public. Uh, so when we talk about uh, the overall value chain of financial um, uh, transparency, we have to see it as um, part of a larger value chain, uh, value chain of uh, processes. As I've already mentioned, financial transparency um, only allows or disclose uh, fiscal data and information to the general public. But we have to be aware that the public has to be uh, proactive in order for that data to be to make sense and to allow uh, further use. Because without use of the shared data or shared information, the transparency makes no sense. Therefore, public participation should actually give life to the fiscal uh, transparency or the transparency mechanisms that one municipality in this case can can use. Of course, transparency by its own uh, combined with participation can be a mechanism for securing better public policies. But in order to close the circle, one politician or um, uh, public official uh, can only uh, secure trust and good practices if after the execution of those policies and implementation of those policies, they are accountable to the people or the people can hold the public officials accountable in this process. There are many ways that we can do this uh, in today's digital world, and I'll talk about a few of them uh, later on in today's session. Of course, in order to be accountable, you should uh, have in mind um, uh, that there are many other ways to secure uh, good accountability. And one of those ways is to um, improve the outcomes or link whatever you're trying to uh, achieve by engaging the citizens and uh, in including them in the budget making process. Um, but link every single policy that create with them with a specific outcome or an indicator that will make sure that once it is implemented, citizens will be sure and uh, would know that whatever you uh, proposed saw the light of the day and brought um, positive social, environmental, economic outcome uh, or any type of outcome that you might have at the very beginning of this process. So in order to publish fiscal information, 
there are several principles that I've already mentioned in the very beginning, but it is good to reiterate them and uh, make clear that uh, whatever is shared with the public is consistent. Um, why is coordination the first requirement for publishing fiscal information? Knowing that the budget itself, especially the municipal budget, is very horizontal and covers multiple areas, we should make sure that the information, the fiscal information that is shared is not only technical and uh, is related only to uh, financially literate, literate uh, crowd. It should also be coordinated with other sectors because usually when we talk about budgets, it's only the economists or the people that deal with numbers, accountants that are considered to be the targeted audience. But in this case, the main audience are the citizens and the citizens have different needs, especially when we talk about municipal financing and uh, public finance, we talk about different areas such as education, healthcare, social services, environmental issues, uh, small neighborhood issues, if, if you might say. Therefore, in order to be able to create those fiscal, valuable fiscal uh, information, you have to have the coordination of all of those uh, sectors. Consolidated data is something that secures accuracy in uh, the way fiscal information is shared. Without the consolidation of data or putting the data in a manner in a manner that it'll be easily accessible for further analysis and, and work and research on it, um, uh, making sure that, that, that the data is, is consolidated in a way that it's uh, accessible um, is the key step that one municipality should take if it wants to have a feedback from the community uh, through a series of analysis or research. As I've already mentioned, the analysis is also key for this circle, mainly because um, I've already mentioned that earlier, if there is no use of the data that is shared, the transparency of a local government doesn't make sense. So analysis is the outcome of the uh, transparency or the openness of one uh, municipality. Of course, the validation process is one that is very important in the whole sector. I would like to share an, a, a very interesting example. And um, uh, this is a real life example that uh, our organization is going through right now. We are currently working on um, a uh, key reform in financing, in changing and reforming the, uh, the financing of primary education in North Macedonia. So we closely work with the Ministry of Education, knowing that the function of education is decentralized. The government um, uh, give tra gives transfer to, uh, transfers to uh, municipalities and then municipalities uh, manage those funds uh, and finance the education process. Uh, throughout the, the year. One of the greatest challenge that we faced and the overall system uh, uh, faces is the fact that in the current data sharing system, there is no mechanism for validation of data. Therefore, the municipalities and the, the, the primary schools enter data into the integrated system, but because there is no validation mechanism, they have to report those data put in a hard copy um, uh, file uh, to the mu municipality. And then the municipality with the validation signature of the mayor sent to the Ministry of Education. So this talks about a system that is fragmented, a system that is uh, not, um, not serving the purpose of uh, uh, transparency and uh, openness of the institutions. Therefore, uh, validation of data is very important. And, it's the, and in today's digital age, we have to be aware and we have to start trusting the systems because there are more efficient ways to verify data uh, through today's digital work than it used to be in the past. So validation of data 
especially fiscal data, will be more relevant as the time comes. So before we keep on going and talking about citizen budget, I would like to ask if there is any question, comment, or any type of, um, uh, of um, experience to be shared by what I've already said by any of the participants in the workshop. Okay, I don't see any raised hands or, uh, okay, Clara, go for it. Yeah, um, since I read your research very carefully, there's one thing that I, I would like you to, to explain. And that's the conclusion that public support for the local government increases with this increased transparency. If you wanna just mention that uh, a little bit. So, um, one of the greatest challenges that we identified throughout the, the process was that citizens and public officials have different perception of transparency, different perception of participation as well. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, when we talk to mayors and we ask them, how often do you talk to the citizens and how often do you take into consideration their proposals, uh, their initiatives, and how often do you put those initiatives in the local budgets? The answer of every single mayor was every single day. I go out, I talk to the citizens, I engage them in multiple activities. However, when we ended up going and talking to the citizens, they said that they don't consider that type of informal uh, communication with uh, the mayor an official way to actually uh, create public policies. Therefore, it is very important for local governments to know that if they create an ongoing sustainable system that will not depend on political will, but it'll be systematically embedded in the everyday activities and life of the public servants, they will be able to get the right ideas at the right time. If they're able to get the right ideas and on right time, at the right time, they will be able to create public policies that will be relevant for the citizens of that municipality. If you're relevant, if your projects are relevant, if they're making the right impact to the local citizens, to the local communities, your trust grows. Why? Because you listen. First, you listen, then you deliver. Of course, you share that with your citizens so that they are aware of the benefits that the transparency mechanisms bring to their everyday lives. Uh, all of you who come from uh, municipalities, you deal with everyday problems of the citizens. Sometimes when we listen to the news and they talk about the budget deficit of the country, the public debt, or the capital investments, and they talk about millions, billions of euros, they seem very abstract to the citizens. But when you talk to local governments and local communities, you get to a point where you talk about the local street, the sewage system, the schools, the kindergartens, the problems that, or issues or activities that citizens face every single day every minute of their life that are very um, relatable to the citizens. So if you are open to the citizens, if you listen to them, if you put and consider their, uh, their proposals in some sort of a budget proposal, and especially present it in a citizens friendly way, they will know that part of that success or part of that positive change in the society is because of their initiative. Therefore, you build the trust further on with your citizens. Clara, I hope this answers your question. I think there was another raised hand, so. Yes, <clears throat> good afternoon, it's you Tula from South Africa. Hi. I, I just want to know, how does your municipalities structure the budget? Is it a constituency based 
or is central to the to the to the head offices of the municipality that is the municipality decides the municipal uh, management or politicians decide what the people want or is it constituency based the constituency let's say give to the politician who represent them what they want or is that the politicians in the municipal council who makes a decision or how is it structured by the law uh, the municipality uh, or the councillors in the municipal council are the ones that vote for the, the, the budget. The budget is, is proposed by the mayor himself or mayor's office. Uh, however, uh, according to the latest changes in the organic budget law in our country, the uh, citizens are integral part of the budget process, which means that local local authorities should consider people's and, or constituents' uh, opinions uh, while making the prep or while preparing the, the budget itself. Uh, what does this mean? This means that even though the budget is proposed by the mayor, voted by the council, it should primarily come through the initiatives of the citizens. So, uh, even though there is no um, structural mechanisms, it is up to the to the municipalities to choose their ways of communicating and participating and engaging with uh, the citizens. Um, uh, there is a, a legal um, legal ground for municipalities to engage citizens. Uh, another thing is that. Um, uh, whenever the budget process starts, the municipalities ask all of their units. When I say units, I mean education units, primary schools, secondary schools, social service units, uh, communal enterprises, to actually send them um, budget proposals for the next fiscal year. The municipal administration then puts together a comprehensive budget that represents the needs and the ask what the units asked at first place. Of course, there is there are limits that are set at the very beginning of the process so that the units and the municipality itself doesn't go beyond the actual uh, plan for the revenues of the local uh, budget. Uh, because otherwise, uh, arrears will uh, show up and the liquidity will be uh, put into, into question. So uh, uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but in general, there, uh, it is made by the mayor, but it should consider citizens', uh, citizens um, uh, thoughts, opinions, and participation uh, throughout the process. Uh, yes, I think part of my question is answered, but uh, I was just imagining in South Africa, we have such an unequal society uh, where you have got uh, citizens that are completely illiterate mm -hmm. and they're extremely poor, and uh, you have got uh, uh, citizens that are that uh, are educated uh, middle class or even uh, above middle class that benefits, but uh, those who are completely illiterate, who cannot read some. So in South Africa, we have got a, a, a challenge. Hence, I was asking if you consider constituency based budgeting. So we know that uh, this community and this community and this community must be catered for in the budget without uh, them uh, having much contribution, even if they don't have, but uh, if they don't have a voice on their own because of they get marginalized sometimes by language that is preferred by the municipality. And uh, we have got such kinds of problems uh, in our municipalities, in fact, in South Africa throughout. But uh, I hear your, your explanation and thank you so much. Yeah, this is a very relevant point and we will talk about this um, and I would be more than happy to hear 
your um, opinions and, and, and experiences because um, the first part of the citizen budget process um, is actually going to your citizens uh, because uh, the citizen budget on its own or the overall um, uh, budget process uh, will only make sense if you actually relate to the citizens' needs. And why? what do I mean by that? Um, uh, we all talk about consultation processes uh, beforehand um, uh, when we talk about uh, budget making. However, uh, the first step of a citizen budget creation is actually going to your citizens and asking them, identifying them, um, their needs and their ways of understanding the budget. Uh, we'll talk briefly uh, in, in, in a few minutes about, about that, but before I start talking about the phases, the elements of the citizen budget, um, just to give you a short general overview of what a citizen budget is and why do we need it. Citizen budget is not, um, uh, is not, um, a process that has been around for many decades, years. It is relatively uh, uh, new, uh, especially to the developing world. Citizen budgets were generally um, created for citizens to understand the very hard to read budget document that it's usually 400, 500, 1000 pages long, it has a lot of numbers, a lot of tables, uh, and very uh, small amount of information that is relatable or is relevant for uh, the citizens. That's why uh, decades ago, uh, municipalities and uh, central governments started creating local, city, uh, local and central citizen budgets or simplified version of the budget that represents the core functions, the core elements of, um, of the budget, which is very hard to, to read. Um, in the past, uh, okay, so uh, I, this is not my photo. I took it from one uh, presentation I'm sorry, I can't uh, remember which one of it, uh, which one was it, but I really liked it because it illustrates uh, in a very brief uh, photo how uh, the citizen budget should look like and what it should uh, represent uh, in its in its essence, in its in its core. Uh, so, in order to have a, a, a reliable uh, source of information and not only simplified version of, of, the, of the budget. The citizen budget should actually uh, have three key elements in its own structure as an information. It should show the income or the revenues that the municipality plans to have in the coming year. It should have the expenditures. Of course, it should also consider the deficit or the, uh, or the surplus that the municipality plans to have, but also the ways how the municipality will cover that deficit uh, if there is, there is one, and usually uh, there is. The key question for the citizens is not only how we are gonna get the money, it is also how the municipality will spend the money. That's why it is very important for municipalities to be open and transparent in many ways by showcasing the citizens that the money that they give for the operations of the municipality end up back to their own uh, benefit, not to the benefit of the officials or some elites. Um, so in a nutshell, the the at the very beginning, when the, the concept of citizen budget was uh, presented, 
uh, it actually showcased this key elements, the income, the expenses, details about expenses, and if there was a deficit, how it was uh, financed. As the time progressed, as the concept of citizen budgets became more relevant for the overall uh, uh, participation and transparency um, of the municipalities and central governments, the concept of citizen budgets grew and expanded to a way bigger and way broader um, a form of uh, mechanisms. There are just several uh, front pages of a citizen uh, budget of different municipalities and central governments. As you could see, they're all different. There is no one, uh, one size fits all. Municipalities especially have to adapt the way the citizen budget looks um, to the needs and the way its citizens are. As you've mentioned, in South Africa, there are many illiterate people that the municipalities should, um, uh, should address and include in order to have equitable uh, budget. So one of the ways for municipalities to approach those citizens is to actually ask them and identify the ways they can understand if they can't read, if they are not capable of understanding uh, such forms of, of communication, they should, they should find the most simple way that they can convey the message and engage those citizens in different um, uh, budget making practices. Uh, we had a, a, a chance to work with one rural municipality during the research we did with ICLB. And uh, we talked to the mayor, especially about this, uh, this topic. Those rural areas are more agricultural, uh, farming uh, families, families that are low income, don't have the access to uh, public uh, uh, services or uh, their voice is rarely uh, heard. So we asked the mayor, okay, give us examples or ideas how municipalities can uh, actually work with those people, engage them, um, make sure that their opinions uh, are worth it in, in the process. So uh, in that particular case, it was that um, the mayor said that it is such a big honor for the farmers, for the rural communities to see that the mayor, the official representative of the local government comes uh, regularly to visit them and talk to them. If they're illiterate, then talking to them is one of the ways to, uh, to approach and, and, and listen to what they, they have to say. If they're not able to uh, officially submit a proposal to the government, have local, um, local administration that will go there, take notes, and on their behalf, propose those, um, those, uh, uh, those ideas uh, to the local uh, government. If, they, if you identify that there are uh, youngsters that are interested in local finances and how the budget how the local money are spent, uh, how the local money is spent, uh, but they are not interested in uh, reading uh, and, and, and wasting uh, uh, time on, 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 on um, informing themselves, then find uh, innovative ways through videos, through short clips. Uh, young people use social media, relate to them on social media and find ways to engage uh, with them. In the past, I'll talk about this comparison between the past or traditional citizen budgets and how citizen budgets look now, but I'll just mention one, one thing. In the past, citizen budgets were a PDF document that is either um, spread out throughout the internet or it's hard copied and then distributed among the, uh, the citizens. I'm not saying that it's not relevant anymore. There are areas, there are communities that would rather have a copied version of a document that they can read whenever they want throughout the day. But we can't abandon the fact that 
most of the uh, young population, most of the professional working class people, they use technology today. So in order to include them and inform them about the, the um, uh, public finances, uh, the citizen budget can take different shapes and forms. So if you're a municipality, one of the questions that I assume you ask at the very beginning is how to make the citizen budget, how, where to start, what to do, what are the steps that one can take to make this happen? So at the very beginning, I said that it is very important for municipalities to open discussion at the very beginning of the process. And when I say open discussion and consultations with the citizens, I don't necessarily only talk about talking to the people about local projects, initiatives, or um, uh, some other ideas that they might have that should be considered in the, in the overall budget. I'm primarily talking about asking the citizens what they want to see in the citizen budget. Why is this so important? Uh, in 2017, uh, when I entered the Ministry of Finance as advisor to the minister, one of my first tasks was to publish a citizen budget. So I sat down with uh, uh, colleagues from the budget department. We started talking about ways how to create the citizen budget. We saw positive examples from our neighboring countries, um, et cetera. And then we came up with the concept from our offices of how the citizen budget should look. Then we published the first citizen budget on the supplementary budget that, that, that we proposed at that time because it was in the middle of the, of the year. And it was uh, very well perceived by the public because after so many years of public pressure for publishing such a document, the Ministry of Finance finally published the citizen budget. However, when I talked to the people about the, the content of the citizen budget, I realized that their first reaction was, but it is still a long document. Our, the first version of the citizen budget was around 20 pages. They said, I, I don't want to spend that much time. Then uh, the next fiscal year came, we published this, the next uh, citizen budget and we realized that actually the, uh, the core information of the, of the uh, citizen budget was not the general information of the budget process, which is the same and it doesn't change over time, but it takes five or six pages of the, of the whole document the essence of what we want to share with the citizens is actually information directly related to, the, to this year's uh, budget. So we decided to shorten the version of the citizen budget, um, but even though uh, it was more accessible and it was open, we felt like it doesn't serve the purpose. Why? Because citizens were not satisfied with the amount of information they get you know, when you publish uh, data in general, it is a hot topic at the very beginning. But if you continue publishing, the, the interest of the public doesn't always stay up high. It's not on the top all the time. It is uh, a driving uh, up and down curve uh, that, 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 that won't allow you to be very comfortable over time and just publish and, and, and share the same information over and over again. That's why we sat down and we said, let's talk to the citizens and see what they want. So we started some public consultations, uh, especially with the civil society, the expert community, academia, that would probably be, and, and journalists, that would probably be the, the ones that will use the citizen budget uh, information the most. So we sat down, did focus groups, and we realized that they are looking for a more interactive uh, way of showing the budget. Um, interactive way that will allow citizens to be reactive other than passive, to be proactive other than passive uh, consumers of the information of the citizen budget. 
Uh, and we came up with the idea that, okay, if the citizens have ideas how a citizen budget should look like and how it should function, then we should organize a hackathon. A hackathon is um, a 48, 72 hour um, event where uh, programmers, designers, economists, marketers uh, get together. And in those 48 or 72 hours or 24 hours sometimes, create a solution for a specific problem. In this case, our problem was we need a citizen tool for presenting the citizen budget, a tool that will be perceived by the citizens as a great tool and a tool that will be used, that will uh, have a meaning over time. Therefore, we sat down, opened the call. We had seven teams that worked on the idea. And at the end, we came up with, uh, or one of the teams came up with a great idea of digitally showing the uh, the citizen budget. However, when we talked to the open budget initiative, um, the that's the organization that that measures the open budget index, and we said that we finally uh, have the digital solution of the citizen budget. They said uh, it is good, but you have to have a document uh, at the end of the day. Like there has to be a a, a, a PDF. Uh, at the end of the day. So uh, because it should uh, be relatable to everyone, not only to uh, the digital um, uh, tax savvy uh, people. So uh, we have to come up with a, a, a smart solution of how to have both the digital and the, uh, the, uh, the, the hard copy or the PDF form of, of the budget. Uh, I'm not part of the Ministry of, Edu of, um, of Finance anymore uh, for many years, uh, and uh, but I'm a very active user of the Citizen Budget and other transparency tools that that uh, were mainly created uh, during the time when I was there. Um, and I can see that the latest. Uh, let me show you the the, the platform. Um, the latest data that is uh, available. Uh, on the on the platform, as you could see, is 2022, and it's already 2023. So I was wondering uh, what happened. Uh, this platform should be automatically updated. Uh, it should be open to uh, the people. It should give uh, relevant information about the. Uh, the revenues, the, the expenditures should give um, um, an overview of the of the of the budget of the country. I don't know why it's so slow. Uh, anyways, and then I found out that the person who was responsible for maintaining the website doesn't work at the Ministry of Finance anymore. So it means that uh, even though there is a very good initiative even though there is a very um, proactive and open process, process that gave citizens way to enter the public finances the way they wanted, uh, is not functioning because of a human error or human will. Political or administrative, doesn't matter. It is someone's will not to continue um, uh, showing and publishing this, this information. Therefore, my sincere um, uh, sincere uh, advice to all of you who would be uh, interested in publishing a citizen budget, especially in a digital form, to make sure that the processes that you create do not depend on people, uh, but depend on the technical abilities of uh, uh, systems themselves, because you might find yourself into a situation where a very valuable um, document or a tool can be misused or not used at all, just because somebody wanted that to, to happen. Uh, there are many types of consultations that you can do. Uh, there, are, I, I don't think that um, 
I should be going into details and, and bothering you with, with theory, but you can always refer to the toolbox that, that we published with, um, uh, that ICLB published um, a few months ago. Uh, but in general, uh, you shouldn't only consider the traditional ways of engaging citizens. There are many ways that you can uh, be creative uh, and be open to the citizens. Because if you uh, make this activity to uh, have a citizen budget without consulting with your citizens, you will be creating a document, you will be creating an information that will not be used by anybody. And as Clara, uh, Clara asked at the very uh, uh, previously, uh, that transparency builds trust uh, between among citizens and uh, between citizens and, and public officials. If you publish a citizen budget just for the sake of publishing a document that is called citizen budget, then you better not do it. It won't result in any. Um, benefit for you as a public official or the citizens. A citizen budget should be serving the citizens at first. By serving the citizens, you serve yourselves as well, because you are one of them, but you're representing them. And if they're not satisfied, you won't be satisfied with what you're doing as well. Uh, that's why the consultation process when you start building the citizen budget is very important. And this process usually happens the first time you publish the, the, the citizen budget. And it doesn't happen for a while until you figure out or you get reactions by citizens that the current form of the citizen budget doesn't work or it's not relatable to them anymore. And then you start the process again. That's why, because it doesn't happen every year, or every semester, it has to be done properly at the very beginning. And that's why you need to spend enough time, resources, and effort to make these consultations uh, work at the very beginning. Then comes the step or the process of making the citizen budget. The citizen budget can uh, is a very interesting uh, tool, uh, should be an interesting tool for the citizens. However, as you saw earlier, and you will see later uh, some examples of digital citizen budgets or transparency um, uh, platforms that I would love to share with, with you all, uh, is the fact that they differ from uh, uh, different countries. That's not, um, uh, that's very relevant. Why? Because different types of citizens require different types of citizen budgets. This is not only relevant when we see the aggregated picture of uh, countries, regions, municipalities. This is also relevant for uh, a micro analysis. What do I mean by this? Uh, if your goal is to have citizen budget that will serve the community, the general public, then you should find ways and do surveys uh, and see what the majority of, um, of citizens uh, use and, and want to use when it comes to informing themselves for uh, uh, fiscal related issues. However, if you want to uh, present a citizen budget, uh, and let's say that, that the best way to do it is through a comic or through a video. Uh, and you serve the purpose of covering the citizen budget throughout that channel for the general public. But then the, uh, the counselor's group uh, from a certain political party comes to you and says, I need a citizen budget to understand the budget better so that I can advocate for, um, for the interest of my constituents. You cannot use the same type of citizen budget to those uh, people that come to you. Therefore, you have to have a clear uh, idea of who you're targeting with a specific citizen budget. As I told you, when we did the digital version of the citizen budget, they told us, but you have to have a printed out version of the citizen budget. Why? Because somebody might use it as a relevant, reliable source of information 
for the general public. That might be journalists, that might be researchers that want to uh, uh, cite or want to quote uh, some part of a certain document and they cannot quote or cite uh, a digital platform that doesn't have uh, any explanation or uh, resource um, uh, resource available for uh, such type of, of analysis. Therefore, when making the, 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 the budget, the citizen budget, you should be very considerable of the interest of different uh, target groups that you have in your mind. Communication is the kink. That's what we wrote in the toolbox, and trust me, it is. Uh, when I talked about consultations, I told you that you might create a citizen budget that is not relatable and relevant to the citizens, uh, and you have missed the opportunity to, to engage with the citizens at the very beginning. But if you went through the process of consultations and making the citizen budget, and you put so much effort, resources, uh, and time on, on, on that process, but you fail to communicate the outcome of the citizen budget, then you fail to um, present the citizen budget the way it should be presented uh, to the citizens. Therefore, there are many mechanisms, approaches um, to address this issue. Opening up to the community, opening up to the citizens uh, at the end of the process, presenting the citizen budget, uh, visiting them in their own environments and presenting it and discussing it with them will allow you and give you um, time and space to actually relate to their problems, to their issues, and builds those bridges that can result in uh, greater trust. Uh, communication is also key uh, from a different angle. I'll talk about this a little bit uh, later, but I would like to mention it now as well. In the past, uh, citizen budgets were usually published when the budget was enacted by the parliament or the council. And it was too late for citizens to get engaged or do something about it. It was too late in the process for them to change, to influence, to make the budget more um, reliable and open to them. Therefore, the modern, the modern approach of communicating is that you publish the citizen budget way early in the process, when it's in the shape or form of initial uh, calculation or initial proposal. Even before it goes to the uh, municipal council, the, the mayor, the cabinet of the mayor, the, the public administration should find ways to communicate with different uh, interest groups, different parts of the citizen budget. Therefore, it is very important to have a communication strategy that will not only uh, take care of the external communication of the citizen budget. Municipalities should have an internal communication strategy or approach or plan when it comes to citizen budget. In order to have to make it a useful tool and document, you should make all the, the um, employees at the public administration aware of such documents. What do I mean by this? Let's say that you are an employee that works uh, in the department or unit for primary education in your municipality. There are people who come and ask you about the capital investments in the XYZ school in your district or your municipality. If you don't know that there is a document that actually showcase in a very simple manner the budget, um, the, budget the, the project that are financed through the budget of the municipality, then you will probably go through the whole document of the budget, identify those uh, programs, and then share it with the citizen. From one side, you will lose a lot of time. From the other side, the citizen will probably not understand the numbers that you give because they're in a format that are not understandable for, uh, for, for the citizens. Alternatively, you might refer them to the budget department. And then the budget department doesn't care about so much about um, uh, 
uh, the capital investments in in uh, education because they have other day-to-day -day and ongoing jobs that they need to uh, work on. Therefore, making all the administration aware of the document and knowing the structure of the document can ease the processes uh, in the municipalities, internal processes in the uh, municipalities, especially when you're communicating with the citizens. Of course, another also important way is to come back to the document whenever the, the process of um, execution of the budget um, comes into question or as, um, uh, as, a, uh, as a topic of interest of the citizens. In the past, citizen budget usually referred to the process of making the budget. However, as the time progressed and as the digital services and digital platforms uh, advanced, Accountability comes to question uh, the the uh, comes into the picture uh, as a very important question as well. So uh, it is one thing to make citizens know about the budget. It is another thing to show them that what we planned is now executed. That's why in the modern in the new uh, citizen budget approaches, we see that the question or the topic of accountability and how the money is actually executed becomes a very relevant topic. Before I go on, is there any question, comment, or um, a, a positive, negative example to share from your, from your experience with the group? I don't see a raised hand or no. Siseko, uh, is this from the the previous uh, raised, raised hand? Uh, yes, it, yes, it is from the previous, but okay. uh, I would love to, to ask you a question sure. uh, that relates to a community. As I was saying, there are poor, many poor mm -hmm. co communities are poor and they don't contribute mm -hmm. in any way to to, to pay for the services or what whatever you uh, 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 to the municipality. Well, now when they, it comes sorry. to budget, uh, they don't contribute uh, through taxes or they don't pay their their dues to the municipality. That's what. To, yes. Okay. Uh, that's okay. correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now my question is: How then do you then? Uh, how do they then begin to participate in a municipality where they don't have any contribution in whatsoever manner? Yeah, it is a very relevant topic and a very interesting issue uh, that, trust me, it's not only uh, uh, a, a relevant issue for uh, South Africa, it is also a very relevant topic for, I believe, all developing countries. There are areas that do not contribute for uh, the, the overall well-being and um, uh, do, do not financially contribute for uh, the budgets and uh, in general the, uh, the revenues of, of the municipalities and the, and the countries. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the municipalities and the central government shouldn't pay attention uh, to those people. Why? Because there might be factors that prevent those people from actually being uh, included in those processes. That's why uh, I, this is my personal opinion uh, that um, those people shouldn't be neglected and not taken into account. Those people should actually, the local governments especially, should put even more emphasis in engaging those citizens into the processes of budget making and um, uh, project, uh, project creation, mainly because if those citizens gi are, are given the right chance and approach, they might start or become um, a re a relevant contributors to the, to the uh, societies. What do I mean by this? Uh, 
As an association, we also worked with uh, local municipalities on key infrastructure. And we uh, worked on feasibility studies on roads, sewage systems, um, uh, street lighting, uh, uh, transportation services for local communities, et cetera. So communal services that can better the lives of uh, local citizens. Usually when we do feasibility study on a remote community that doesn't contribute, that is not well perceived by the rest of the community. Uh, and we, when we go out there and do the social analysis survey, we survey the people, we talk to them, we realize that actually those people, not only that they don't have the qualifications or they're not integrated in the society, the society doesn't uh, pay attention to them as well. That's why uh, when you talk about when we talk about those kind of um, those kind of cases, we should always keep in mind that uh, if a rural community, remote community, doesn't have connection to the city or to the larger community that is next to it, there are no roads, there is no infrastructure. How do you expect them to integrate into the system? So by including them into the system, regardless of the fact that they're not the right contributors at this time, you will create an avenue for them to become so. Otherwise, they will keep be uh, excluded from the local processes, uh, municipal processes. And not only that those people will suffer, but also your communities, the more developed and contributing parts of the um, uh, of the community will suffer as well, because few kilometers away from the developed and contributing uh, part of the municipality, they would have, uh, in a way, a threat, uh, a, an unwilling environment that also affects the quality of life. Uh, it doesn't only affect the quality of life of those that are excluded. So uh, I know that this is very theoretical but um, that this might sound very theoretical, but in practice, I do believe, and I've seen a lot of projects that have given the right uh, amount of, um, of uh, strength to those communities uh, where they benefited, even though they, they're not contributing, but they are contributors later. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, the, the capital of Macedonia, Skopje, uh, is a very diverse uh, city. Uh, great number of ethnicities live here, different religions, different cultures, et cetera. There is a municipality that is predominantly populated with Roma, uh, uh, Roma ethnicity. Um, and uh, years ago, there was no, uh, that municipality is located just a few kilometers from the center of the city. Few years ago, there was no proper infrastructure for them to even communicate with, uh, uh, with the citizens. There was no sewage system. Uh, the uh, the um, houses that uh, people in the municipality lived in were not even legalized. So with proactive role of the local community that can be changed and it's partially changed and we can see the change uh, happening years later. When you provide key infrastructure for those people, sewage system, uh, proper uh, uh, water supply, electricity supply, you legalize, you put them in the system by legalizing their houses and their properties, uh, you provide education institutions, you provide kindergartens for the women uh, to be able to go and be active uh, on the labor market. You provide communal services that will better the service, the, the lives of those people. Those people sooner or later will become contributors to the system as well. I was a little bit more extensive, but I hope that I gave you a little idea or some idea of, of how this question or issue can be addressed. Yes, I agree. Uh, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Uh, so 
I'll be very brief uh, in this part because I really want to, to give um, uh, more time on, um, uh, on questions and discussions at the very end. So I already talked about some of these uh, things uh, and I'll just uh, repeat uh, some of them, but we'll also mention some, some new ones. As I, as I already told you, traditionally citizen budgets were documents that were very boring. They uh, presented the priorities, the budget classification, the revenues, the, uh, some data on uh, macroeconomic uh, indicators. And it was still a document that was not relatable to the general public. It was good document for the uh, experts, for the research community. But at the end of the day, they didn't always serve the purpose of a citizen budget. Today, citizen budgets listen to the demand of information, which means that they um, adopt to the needs and the interests of the final beneficiaries or the users of those um, of those documents. That's why a lot of municipalities, a lot of central governments do surveys, analysis, uh, and analyze the um, access to information requests to see what citizens actually ask for and what they want to see and what are the forms and shapes of documents that they are most, most comfortable uh, using in their everyday life. Uh, one example is also uh, using already existing data sets that are out there. Facebook has an AI ads tool that can serve the municipalities to see what interests the most, uh, the local, uh, what is of a great interest of the local community based on their uh, social media uh, activities and, 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 um, and habits. Uh, another comparison between traditional way of presenting citizen budgets and what's happening now is that in the past, citizen budgets were a very passive documents and they were very aggregated, which means that they would give us, um, this is how much the revenues were, are, this is how much the expenses are. Uh, the revenues are, uh, come from the following three sources. The expenditures are allocated in the following, uh, if it's either a functional classification, administrative classification, economic classification, and that's it. They're very aggregated in a sense that citizens do get a sense of what the budget looks like, but they still don't know the essence of the budget. They don't know the project. They don't know what it means that X amount of money goes to public safety. However, today's approach and this modern uh, era approach is that this data that we have now is linked and disaggregated uh, by projects, by initiatives, by indicators. So if we say that uh, the functional uh, area education uh, will get uh, 100 million euro uh, for the next fiscal year, then we see the projects or the initiatives that would get uh, parts of that uh, budget. And then by allowing uh, more data processing, uh, you will also enable citizens and those that use the, the data to actually do a time series analysis and see how those budgets uh, change over, over time. Whether let's say the budget for the primary education uh, effectively is bigger or smaller uh, than, than last year's. Is the municipality really investing more money uh, in primary education or it's only decorative, uh, uh, decorative uh, statement by the local uh, governments? In the past, as I said, citizen budgets were usually published when the executive budget proposal was sent or the approved budget uh, uh, was uh, was finally uh, accepted by the relevant institution. Today, there is a timeline of the events and different stages require different types of um, different versions of the citizen budget. Why is this so important? If you as a municipality publish the um, the budget uh, when it's in it, uh, its draft working form format, 
when it's still not sent to the municipal council. You publish it. Then there is public consultation. Citizens react. Citizens add, exclude some parts of the uh, of the budget, and then you send and publish the version of the executive budget that is sent to the council. Citizens are able to see that their opinions matter, that there has been some change from the moment that the um, uh, mayor started making the budget to the moment it got to the uh, council. Then. Uh, they can use the, uh, if there are more projects or if there is more interest by the citizens, they can use the councillors to amend the proposed budget. And finally, when it's approved, you will have three versions of the budget. The last one is the enacted budget, which is the relevant document, but then the citizens can see the evolution of the budget over the budget process. As I said, Accountability is very important in today's world, and it's uh, becoming a more relevant um, source of information when it comes to fiscal transparency. Therefore, uh, you can always relate uh, and link, cross-reference the uh, information you have from the citizen budget, the enacted budget, and then compare to the reports that are usually uh, in the middle of the year or at the end of the year, so that you show the citizens what projects were actually executed, implemented, and what hasn't been successfully um, uh, showcased. Um, as I said, traditionally, uh, the citizen budgets took some, um, I would say, boring sometimes uh, forms uh, that were very fixed, whereas now they're very interactive. Uh, modern citizen budgets allow citizens to play with the data, to download them in an open format, to further analyze them and consider them as a reliable uh, data. And this is the way uh, every municipality and central government should go forward. I don't think that I should be uh, speaking further. <laughs> uh, I just want to, to uh, share with you uh, two very good examples of uh, citizen budget platforms that I've found on the internet while preparing for, the, uh, for this workshop. The first one is actually the uh, budget website of the, or budget monitor of uh, Georgia. Interestingly enough, uh, the Georgian portal is not run by the Ministry of Finance. It is uh, run by the State Audit Office. Uh, this is a platform that showcases um, a lot of details beyond the citizen budget uh, uh, scope of, of work. But uh, what I really liked about this, um, this platform is that it has all the elements a citizen budget should have. Um, it showcases the uh, revenues, the expenses, in a different format. You can play with, you can see the data, you can work with different, you can choose different municipalities, compare them, uh, you can download the data uh, that is available. The thing that I don't like about this or the, the thing that this platform is missing is actually more disaggregated data, something that I spoke about. So if we see um, that property taxes are third largest uh, income, uh, let's say, let's see what's the dynamics. Let's see, uh, even uh, you can, uh, uh, de depending on the statistics level that this uh, data is collected on, but you can see what neighborhoods contribute the most uh, in the property taxes uh, income. Of course, in order to have that, you need to have uh, modern digital systems uh, that, that will provide you with that. However, uh, if you don't, this is a great um, outline of, of information. Of course, you can always uh, download uh, a PDF version of what you see here. And then I came across, actually, this is where I got the photo with the, uh, with the piggy bank. Um, this is a municipal platform from South Africa. 
And I'm very happy that we have participants from, from South Africa. And I really liked this uh, platform because it's very similar to what I showed you um, in Georgia, um, uh, but it's even further um, uh, more explained about each indicator, um, how is it measured, uh, calendar of activities. I'm not sure how this platform is maintained, if it's manually or it's a system database that, that creates those uh, these reports. Uh, uh, participants from South Africa can can uh, uh, can contribute and, and and jump in if you if you want. But this is also a great example of how um, uh, one centralized uh, system can can uh, look like and serve the purpose of openness and transparency uh, by the municipalities. That will be all for me. I will be more than happy to answer any of your comments, questions, um, uh, some things that were not clear or were clear enough, but you want to share your uh, thoughts and opinions or experiences with the rest of the group. If there is no, I could assume that you understood everything or you understood nothing. Uh, so, um, yeah. Uh, Ziggy? Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, Vicky. Yeah, uh, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, no, maybe not a, a, a big question, but just to say thank you very much for a very informative uh, presentation. Um, I would just maybe like to find out if you're going to share these slides that you just presented here. They are very informative. I think one really have to check, but I wanted to find out if, is there any international or any maybe policies that guiding this particular important uh, program, uh, which is budgeting, budget, I mean, citizen budget. Yeah, just to check if, is there any way of trying to prescribe to the countries to try to follow a particular system to ensure that um, this important uh, tool is being implemented in different uh, countries or even different municipalities? Because I think this is a very important tool that I think it will assist the communities to be able to have a budget that inform, that is informed by what the people you know, want uh, to see happening in the other countries. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ziggy. This is a very relevant question. It is actually one of the key uh, hypotheses that we had uh, when we started doing the research several years ago with the ICLD. Uh, there is um, a, a comprehensive um, methodology for um, uh, for openness of the budget process, which is open budget survey, open budget index. However, what we found out when we did the research, this is a methodology that is applied only on central level institutions, central government budgets. Uh, then our main question was, uh, okay, how do we make it relevant for local governments? Because uh, it would be very good and cool to have such a comprehensive uh, approach uh, to such uh, to such measurements and 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 having methodology that uh, different municipalities can can follow throughout the the, the world. Uh, there are several initiatives that that cover this uh, topics. Uh, however, one of the the outcomes of our research was establishing an open budget uh, open municipality index which is very similar to what the open budget index does for central governments. We measure it for our local governments in, uh, in Macedonia. Um, the issue of applying that method elsewhere is the fact that uh, local governments are um, different from state, from a, from a country to a country. So a comprehensive uh, approach as the open budget index cannot be applied even though there are some basic principles uh, of the budget making process. Uh, therefore, uh, our, uh, our 
uh, idea is that uh, an index or a methodology like that can be done on a world level, but it should be adopted and taken case by case uh, into consideration so that it's reliable and relevant for uh, the, the local governments. Uh, we are discussing with ICLD how we can spread this and, and continue working with municipalities in order to have uh, such a such a such an approach. So uh, we would be more than happy and open to to hear ideas from uh, firsthand ideas from from you all. Uh, let me just come in because you have already indicated that uh, you are leaving. Uh, just a follow up from what Ziggy has uh, said. I believe it's also uh, contaminated by uh, the possibilities of our government ignoring it for purposes uh, that uh, we do not know. Hence, probably is asking internationally if is there a way you can force another state to say implement this. Uh, because here in South Africa, one other problem we have is we have the so-called service delivery protests where you find the citizens, if they want, uh, let's say, a school to be built, they will uh, 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 destroy a clinic out of anger because uh, they don't understand why uh, the municipality is not building them the school that they have been asking maybe for 10 years because our municipality doesn't properly engage or honestly engage with the citizens hence when they get frustrated then they organize themselves ban whatever whether it's a police station in order to get a clinic not understanding that it is their property because they were never consulted before it was built. So to them, it doesn't have a value. It's just a municipal property. And then if they want what they want now, they organize themselves, go in groups, destroy whatever they find on the, on the way. So as to how uh, one can make our government understand, uh, our municipality understand the importance is what we will try because uh, it's quite valuable. I understand the question of Ziggy is based on frustration that we may not be heard, but uh, we are going to try and uh, challenge our municipality to right. implement it. It is a very yeah. relevant discussion and it, it is something that I've mentioned at the very beginning. Um, if citizens don't uh, perceive public funds as their funds, but as funds of the government as an institution, then there's a long way to go when it comes to citizen participation and, and, and citizen uh, part, uh, engaging citizens in, in this type of, of processes. Um, the international uh, measures such as the Open Budget Index in a way create um, pressure to the central and local governments, if you if you want to say, uh, but the fact is that they will create the pressure only if the citizens know about it. Uh, so sometimes we get to a point where uh, a certain country or a certain municipality is ranked on that world ranking very low, but that information doesn't get to the citizens. So so the citizens don't know that for the fact uh, their their municipality and their officials are not doing. Uh, what they're supposed to do. That's why we need champions. We need local people that will be advocating for change. Uh, and again, there is no one size fits all. If a public campaign works in South Africa, a Facebook campaign works in, in Macedonia, uh, public consultation process might work in, in Georgia. There are multiple ways. Uh, I don't know, guerrilla marketing might work in, in Chile. You know, different cultures have different approaches to uh, to some uh, topics that to the topics that we uh, discuss uh, about today. That's why um, identifying those local champions, whether they're from the civil society, whether whether they're uh, from some interest groups or communities or representative of communities, representatives of communities, uh, it doesn't matter as long as you have the people receiving the message and making them aware uh, about the consequences of whatever they would do um, is probably a key element of, uh, of building that, that trust. And 
More importantly, that's not going to be an easy and short-term process. It'll take a long time. It'll take a lot of resources, time, and effort. However, if you want to change the society for the better, change has to happen at some point, regardless of the, of the time spent of the final, uh, final results. Clara? Yeah, I'll just tag along to that um, and say that if you as local governments want some support in trying this out or in just reasoning around how or what framework, what approach might work best in your context, we have some, some support available to engage Victor with you on more of a one-to-one or small group basis. So do reach out to us. You all have my email. Feel free to reach out and signal your interest in that, and we can come up with a format that, that works. Um, and those of you who have municipal partnership with ICLD, feel free to, to use that platform for this. Feel free to discuss with your partner, but also just as, a, as an individual municipality or local government. Because yeah. right, I think there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of benefits to reap from this. There's a lot of momentum to catch from, from all this information. Yeah, and I think that the, the toolbox that was already shared by Clara uh, and it's available on ICLD's website is a very short, comprehensive, and very concrete um, uh, tool to use if you want to start this. Of course, there's a lot to it, uh, mixed to it, uh, and there are a lot of processes that should be considered uh, along the way, but it is a good starting point, uh, at least for giving you the the overall framework of what you need to do uh, to start initiatives uh, like this. Yeah, with that, I think, thank you very much for joining to everyone. Yeah. You know, it's been a long time and we've lost some along the way, but even here we've been at least five countries. I don't know if I've missed some, but we've been in Northern Europe, Eastern Europe, Africa, different countries in Africa. So already we have potential to improve local democracy in at least five countries. And I think that's uh, that's a pretty cool, cool way to leave work today. Uh, and Great. a huge thanks from our side to Victor, of course. Thank you. And to Always all of you. a pleasure. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was informative. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.